It was about two or three years ago when this coin started showing up in our town. Hidden in the most expected places. You need to understand that at the time, our town was not the vibrant community it had once been. Why? COVID, lockdowns, businesses shutting down, maybe a bunch of little things that just add up to something big. Maybe you recognize the feeling. We were running low on hope. And we were beginning to write a story that said the best days were behind us. And as you may know, when you write a story of despair or of hope, either way, you're right. And so our town had, if you will, quietly quit. We were going through the motions, and an old man noticed. And he decided to come along and give us all a little push. Maybe that's the only reason I'm here today, be it ever so simple is to give you a little push. You see, this man knew that the secret to influencing an entire group of people, to getting them to truly transform, that the secret to doing that would be found in his ability to help them change their story. For the story that you write becomes the life you live. You see, this man understood that the secret to persuasion is found in the art of story. So welcome to my tiny little town about a mile and a hair past nowhere. (laughs) A place where the simple life is revered, ordinary heroes are appreciated, and the stories are never fancy. They're just about the people. It's a small town with a big heart where the people stay, but the gossip travels. (laughs) And I'm here today just to share a few of their stories. The first one that I heard about the coin showing up was to Harriet Bumgardner. Harriet and Harold Bumgardner, they live in the white house with the little green shutters and the flowers on the mailbox over on Front Street. Harriet and Harold were the type of couple that sort of blended in, if you know what I mean. They never got overly excited about religion or politics. As parents, they colored inside the lines. They lived in various shades of beige. They were the type of couple that were always invited to the parties, but you could never remember exactly if you'd seen them there. Harriet had a tight bun on the back of her neck. She wore floral and pantyhose. Till the day she dies, she will wear pantyhose. They've lived in that house as long as I've known them, ever since Harold passed. Yes, he passed. Don't be sad. You didn't know him. (laughs) We were sad. He left this world as quiet as he'd lived it, sitting there in his recliner, watching Wheel of Fortune left behind his newspaper crossword puzzle, his glasses, and the smell of Old Spice that had clung to him their whole marriage. Noreen didn't fall apart. We didn't expect her to, no judgment. She just knitted her way through the various stages of grief 
and wondered what she was supposed to do now. I remember it was a Wednesday when he passed because they had prayer meeting over at the church where they spent about five minutes on prayer and the rest of the time picking out what casserole people were going to take over. Where I come from, I don't know about you, but every event is commemorated with a covered dish casserole. You knew how much somebody was loved by how long that line was of food on the buffet. A love that could quickly turn into a grudge if you forgot to return the dish. (laughs) Or if you brought somebody else's award-winning dish. And some of you know what I mean because some of you are known for making something. Those of you in the Midwest, chances are real good. It's got tater tots in it. So, Harriet was standing in the front yard and on a Saturday morning, that's what it was. It was a Saturday morning and Noreen was over from next door giving her a lecture. Noreen's daddy was a colonel. Noreen's love language was not casseroles, it was lectures. Maybe you know the type, more she loved you, the longer she lectured. And she uh, was telling uh, Harriet how you needed to cut the grass in angles instead of straight lines. Harriet was uh, uh, listening politely while Noreen stood about four feet tall. If she had a body type, it'd be rope. (laughs) She had never married. Her only companion was that oxygen tank she rolled along with her, whose hisses punctuated all of her lectures. So she was knee deep into one of these lectures when Harriet gets the mail from the mailman who's just driving by. Harriet gets an envelope, she opens it up, there's a coin inside. It asked her, what would you do if you were brave? Now, Harriet was not usually one for challenges like that. But she knew right away. And before her head could talk her out of it, her heart answered. She'd learned to drive that Buick, sitting in the driveway, waiting for the kids to come pick up and go sell. It had been Harold's. And she'd never learned to drive. And you might be thinking, that's weird. Who doesn't know how to drive? Or maybe you understand. They used to live up in the big city. They didn't need a car. By the time they retired and moved down to our town, well, Harold drove. That's all they needed. Once Harriet said, would you teach me to drive? And he said, oh, that's silly. And it became her one regret. Maybe you know the feeling. So Harriet stood there in that lawn and before her head could talk her out of it, her heart spoke up and it said, Noreen, I want you to teach me to drive today and we'll go sprinkled Harold's ashes. It'll be a good use of the gas in case he's listening. (laughs) Noreen lit up like she just won the lottery. Her zeal for helping people far outweighed the amount of people who ever came to her for help. She was all excited. She said, hold on, I'll be right back. I'm gonna go get some supplies. She goes running into her house and she comes back and she's got a clipboard and she's got a whistle and she's got a machete. (laughs) And she's got a disposable cell phone with a number programmed in it so they could tape it on the inside of the trunk in case they got abducted like she saw on the law and the order. And it didn't matter to either of them that Harriet did not have a license. (laughs) No, Noreen, her nephew was state trooper and they knew if he got in trouble, they'd get out of it. So they got in the car, they took poor Harold in his urn and buckled him in the back seat, said a little prayer, and they got in that car. Now Noreen's teaching style was sink or swim. Here's the gas, there's the brake, don't forget the blinker. And whenever Harriet would mess up, 
Noreen would blow that whistle in her ear and Harriet would cry a little and then they'd get going again. After a few rounds around the church parking lot and the rosebush hit and run that we will take to the grave, <laughs> Harriet started to get the hang of it. Why, she thought driving wasn't so hard after all. She was like, well, it was harder to work the newfangled dishwasher the kids had given them for Christmas. This wasn't such a big deal. And that's when Noreen turned to Harriet and said the words that terrified the daylights out of Harriet. She said, all right, you're ready. Harriet said, ready for what? Noreen said to drive. You're not a real driver unless you learn how to drive on the highway. <laughs> Harriet was terrified. All these thoughts going through her head. What if, what if, what if? What would people say? She's too old. She couldn't do this. Finally, she turns to Noreen and she says, Noreen, I can't do this. I'm not strong enough. I'm not brave enough. And we knew that this was about so much more than driving. Noreen said, Harriet, yes, you can do this. You are strong. We both are. We are brave women. We both are. She said, and do you know how I know? Harriet said, how? She said, because we were in payroll. <laughs> we were warriors of the spreadsheets. We were mighty. We were strong. You knew us by our numbers and the beats of our payroll song. From the corners of the country to the heart of Nashville's beat, the payroll titans gather making all the loose ends meet. With the rhythm in our numbers and a music in our soul, you're the unsung heroes who make all those paychecks roll. to the west and all the places in between in every office big and small you're tapping away at keys unseen but tonight we are in nashville where the music's playing loud because payroll's in the house and we are standing proud payroll stomping boots and crunching numbers to the ground with every calculation regulation we are compliance bound in the spirit of Nashville, we're singing loud and singing clear. We are payroll, heroes of the fiscal year. <laughs> Under neon lights, we celebrate our powerful salary band, armed with timesheets filled out wrong, <laughs> written by sloppy hands. We dance through dumb questions with a twinkle in our eye, exploring workers' comp claims underneath fluorescent sky. Can you add a little extra? Comes a whisper sliding quick, lost time sheets and urgent fixes, each trick as old as brick. Why's my paycheck lighter? The chorus sings in dismay. We juggle every query. We two-step through each delay. We are payroll. Every hurdle we have leapt. In the rhythm of our numbers, all our promises are kept. From Broadway to back office, while we're the unsung beat, we are payroll. And without us, your family doesn't eat. Wait 
withholding taxes, spreadsheets open wide. We navigate through W-2s, precision is our guide. Software glitches, audit frights, each error code we meet. In the rodeos of payroll, we're the champions to beat. We can recite tax codes like lyrics to our songs, laughing over numbers that don't add up as we all hum along. Deadlines loom like storm clouds, paperwork a mountain high. But with a grin and a Nashville spirit, we ride that challenge high. We're the ones the outside world is often to forget what we must endure with our numbers lined in sweat. Don't computers do it all? It seems easy if you ask me. Why, you're just printing checks, they say. How hard can it be? Says the guy who still doesn't know the difference in gross and net. <laughs> Who's nowhere to be found when you need him. And oh, but you can bet he will find your office on payday. Cause now he has a question thinks FIKE is a conspiracy. <laughs> Your deadline's just a suggestion. I can't find my receipts. Is it okay if I just guess? What's this deduction for? We got a check with the wrong address. Do you want it mailed, direct deposit, or maybe carrier pigeon? I should be paid for that day off. It's included in my religion. I didn't tell you about my race. I forgot to mention I'm at the beach. Oh, I forgot to clock out again. Oh, <laughs> that's three times this week. <laughs> this won't cover my bills. Hey, can you get me my financial aid? Honey, his mama's on line three. She wants to know why her baby's not been paid. It's a constant battle. Some days you're not sure if you'll win it. But we know if they stepped in your boots, they would never last a minute. So in this gathering of number crunchers under Tennessee's great sky, you're the heroes of this hour with your non-exempt heads held high. <laughs> we are payroll, hear our song underneath the neon glow. With every calculation, our figures steal the show. In the spirit of Nashville, where dreams come alive, we are strong and we are mighty, and together we'll always thrive. So here's to the payroll warriors in their cowboy boots and hats, turning chaos into order, no matter what the stats. For when it comes to payroll, we don't lose sight of our glory, for our legacy is written by the book in each and every story. For those of you who say you can't impact people with storytelling on a video, you're wrong. Now please welcome to the stage the award-winning storyteller herself to receive the applause she deserves. Welcome Jody Orgill Brown. make me want to sing while humming with my mouth shut. That was beautiful. Thank you. I took a million notes, as I bet you did too. So much we can see that's good and, and rich and beautiful in that. And I, I want to try to even go deeper beyond the surface notes that I took and go underneath and point out layers that I see in your story that we can learn from. 
when I look at a story, I look at, is it compelling? Is it persuasive? And is it easily digestible and repeatable? beyond the bells and whistles like characters and whatnot. I wanna point out, Jody, just four, and all the talking points, by the way, today, or most of them, will be in your portal online. The first thing I noticed was that it was conversational. I felt like that was you. I connected with you. I felt like it was the same Jody up there that I would see, you know, at lunch. The good thing is, there's really only one Jody, and she shows up all the time the same way. <laughs> so that helps. Yes, and it makes me like you, trust you, believe you, and know you. And that is critical for connection. Just as it is in sales, same thing up here. If I don't feel like I know you, I'm not following you on this journey. Thank you for doing that. Was it hard for you, or you just it, did you have to learn how to be conversational, or just kind of comes naturally? It comes somewhat naturally, however, you do have to practice. And I think playing the part of the narrator as well as the characters allows you to be conversational and lead the story in a way that you want it to. So that wherever you want to take the audience, you can just naturally lead them there so they can go along the journey with you. Yes, beautiful. So how do you do that with your story? When you write your story, think about writing it the way you talk, not as if it's meant to be read. Don't use those eyes. Write it as if it's meant to be told. When I tell a, write a story, I practice it as I tell it. Because authenticity is the new polished. The second thing I learned from your story, the layer I see, is it was experiential. And what do I mean by that? You took me to a specific experience that you had. And th why is that so important? I mean, it had a beginning, it had a middle, it had an end, it was a defined moment. W you might be like, duh, but a lot of people in their stories, especially when I go into businesses, they give me a list of facts. That's not a story. A story is about an experience, about somebody who goes through something. They have a conflict, they have a resolution, they have a victory moment on the other side. And I appreciated that it was an experience. I also saw a layer of emotion. I, it had the feels, right? And that is, you might think, why does that matter? Because that's gonna get in a deeper level for me. I'm going to connect. It's going to have a more lasting. You're opening up different parts of my brain. Is it, was it hard for you to be an emotional speaker? Was that hard? Did you have to learn? Did it feel weird or does it always come naturally to you? Because for some of us, it can be kind of hard. My own personal survival story has come with a lot of deep and difficult emotion. And early on, I realized in order to help people understand the principles and the power behind the messages I wanted to teach, I had to go there. I had to go deep. And the deeper I went, the more I realized that people connected with the story, and then they could actually feel it and implement it with the teaching principles that I had. And so I think some people have a hard time. It's fun to have positive emotion and to be dancing and jumping on stage, but it's a little more difficult to be vulnerable and raw. And yet, that's where the real power comes. And I realized if I just embrace that vulnerability and authenticity, that it could become a superpower. And we felt it. You illustrated it beautifully. How do you do that yourself? Well, it can be very practical, actually. First of all, don't tell a story you're not through bleeding from and have found the gift in it. You don't have to be over it, but, but be able to be on the other side of it to some degree. Make sure your story has emotion in its structure. St stories are not just about conflict, resolution, uh, victory moment. They're about the emotion that is attached to it. Don't just tell me what happened to the character in your story. Tell me how it made them feel. How did it make them feel to have this problem? How did it make them feel to get this solution? How did it make them feel to live into a new normal? How did it make you feel to be part of that process? Emotions are critical when it comes to persuasion and they should be included in your story as well. Last thing I wanna point out, though there are many, Jody, and is that I walked away from your story and I knew exactly what to do with it. I knew the point. The point was be kind, listen to that voice, right? <laughs> yes, that was the point. <laughs> and by putting it throughout and weaving it just like you would foreshadow in a book, 
then you're helping them understand the point all the way through. And then they get to the end and they realize, oh yeah, that was the point from the beginning. Yes, yes, bingo. And you might go, duh, I can't tell you how many stories I hear out there in the business world. And you walk away going, what exactly was the point of that? We've got to know what the point is. Before you write that story, before you craft it, think about it. What do you want them to think, feel, or do as a result of hearing this story? Why are you telling them this story? It's not for you, it is for them. What's the lesson, what the point, what's the point? And you may know what it is, but it's not been clearly verbalized in your story. Beautiful job, well done. And with a story like that, I ask myself, because I look at stories like a tool. Are there other things we could add to it that would achieve other purposes? And I thought to myself, what are some of the other layers we could possibly add to that story? And I thought, okay, what if we added a layer of transformation in Jody? What if we added a, I was going through something and this is how this story changed me this moment as a result? I thought, wait a minute, what if she's going to speak to leadership and we could put a strong lead-in statement in the beginning and tap into leadership and their, their issue and make the story connect to that particular audience? Could we do that? And then I thought, what if we give them an actual go do this with this story statement? Now, I know what y'all are thinking. You're like, Kelly, we've told you we don't have that much time to do everything you tell us to do in a story. That story's already 10 minutes long. We add to it, it's gonna be 15 minutes. We don't have 15 minutes to afford in a keynote. Agreed. And you may not even have 10. But you can still add many, many, many layers to the story and do it with few words. So I decided to play and prove it. So I took her words, shuffled them around. Please excuse me for the liberties that I took. They're just choices that we could make. And I decided to see what would happen as a result. And AV team, what if we had a little bit of music? When it comes to leadership, our highest impact is not found in those big stage moments, but rather the small ones we never saw coming. I was reminded of this a few years ago when I was rushing around my city, checking off all these items on this long list of things to do. And I was also in a funk. Business was down. And I was starting to feel like I had been left behind. Like I had lost sight of my purpose. It was on Ogden Street, somewhere on my list between drop off the dry cleaners and pick up the chicken. When I rushed past this man in a wrinkled jacket, he was sitting on the sidewalk with his back up against the brick wall of the coffee shop. He didn't see me and I knew I could just keep going, but that nagging little voice popped into my head. The same one that hung that sign on the wall of my office. It said, no act of kindness is ever wasted. So I stopped and I reached in my pocket and I pulled out this crumpled up $10 bill I'd found in there this morning. I tucked it into his clutched fist and waved and I kept going. I get to the ATM, the next stop on my list. I'm wondering, is the post office going to close before I can get there? I'm punching the buttons. And that little voice in my head whispers again, get more and go take it back to him. So I walk back to the man. I lean down. I said, sir, here's a little bit more. He looked confused. He said, why'd you come back? I said, well, sir, I believe God gives us all divine appointments to step into a stranger's life and remind them that they are loved. His face crumpled up and he told me about the life he used to have and how his wife had died in a fire and he couldn't save her and how he just couldn't find his way back. I can relate, I said. I once had a life-changing event too. 
and I had a hard time finding my way back again. But maybe someone up there wants you to know that if you're still here, you're not done yet. You still got some living to do. Thank you, he whispered. And I walked away. And I remembered that day, I do still have purpose. And if I'm still here, then I'm not done yet either. That was the last time I saw that man propped up against the wall of the coffee shop. Maybe he moved to another street or, I don't know, I like to think that he found his way back. And now today I'm standing in front of you in another divine appointment. <laughs> no, I don't have a crumpled up $10 bill in my pocket to give you, but I'm hoping my message will be enough to let you know that you are seen, that you matter, and that you do have purpose even if you can't feel it. And all the big things we do as leaders, let's not forget the small moments where we can make somebody feel seen. Oh, and don't worry about how to know when you found one. That little voice will tell you. And you never know when that gift will come right back at you. Because no small act of kindness is ever wasted.